Welcome everyone to this cell seminar. Um, a very warm welcome to you all in person and online too. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Eleanor Sharpston, who is the Cambridge Goodhart Visiting Professor this year. Professor Sharpston needs no introduction, not least because she gave a brilliant seminar just about two weeks ago on the value of and the defining role of um, a multilingual court in the operation of the CJEU. I had the privilege of taking Cambridge students to visit the CJEU um, in a number of times some years ago. The most memorable part of the visit was not the guided tour in the Grand Building. It was not the meeting with a young referendaire keen to explain how to get a job at the CJEU. It was always our meeting with Advocate General Sharpston, whose insights into her work give everyone a thorough and unique understanding of what it takes to be simply at the very heart of the development of EU law. Like many, I have greatly benefited from advocate from, from Eleanor Sharpston's generosity in answering my questions about the court. And I'm delighted that she will today, uh, today tell us more about decoding the CJEU judgments. Professor Sharpston, over to you. Um, what, I'm, what I'm going to say should anyway link on reasonably seamlessly from the last seminar because you'll see there's some themes which reappear as, uh, as I go on. But let me begin, let me begin by being brutally honest, all right? The case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union is not a light read for a common lawyer. It is not super accessible. Indeed, there are some judgments that have come out of the court that if I'm suffering from insomnia, I know what to do, I just reach for them, and by the time I've got to about paragraph 64, my eyes close gently, and nothing will retrieve me until the morning. Um, no, really, really and truly, it's not the world's most accessible case law, uh, and I think that's true. It's true if you're a civilian, if you're a civil lawyer, but it's really true if you're a common lawyer, and indeed that's possibly why common lawyers often prefer the opinions of the advocates general, because they say, thank God, at least something I can understand and I can read. Now, having put all of that up front, let's be honest, if you look more closely, there is in fact quite a lot of valuable information that you can pick up and more that's available if you decode the text a bit. So the purpose of today is simply to give you some practical working tips for when you have to have your nose up close and personal to an East Court of Justice judgment. And I'm going to say, you know, before you start on the text, there's some things you can look at before you actually get into paragraphs one, two, three, et cetera. Do actually just look at the start of the case. Uh-huh. What did the court decide to do with this case? As in, where did it send it? How much in the way of resources did the court decide to devote to it? That's the first hint. And it's really, I apologize for pointing out the blindingly obvious, but it's not to be ignored. The court doesn't have a strict regime of stare de chases, right? But there is no way that a chamber of three judges is going to upset settled case law, including three recent cases of the grand chamber. In the real world, that doesn't happen, okay? So have a look where they sent the case to. If they sent it to the Grand Chamber, it's probably because the case is big. It may be because it's sensitive. It may be because the court is about to tweak its case law, which effectively it can do in the Grand Chamber, but shouldn't do in a smaller chamber. Uh, it may be it's going to dig in, on the contrary, and make a big point. We've always been saying this. You've questioned it. But no, this is how we interpret this point. So if it ends up in the Grand Chamber, at least that's a first point to look out for. What about what we call in French the Assemblée Plénière, the full, full court? Well, it's rare, but it's not unheard of. And it is for what is truly a gigantic case, not just a big case, but a blockbuster case. Think opinion one of 13 on ECR accession, 
uh, think case C62118, Whiteman, the Brexit case, think Pringle, case C370 of 12, you know, it's that size of case. At the opposite end of the, case, of the scale are the cases that go to a three-judge chamber. And actually, there's two slightly, in, I know we'd say incoherent, but the sled, two different categories of cases that go to a three-judge chamber. Something that's relatively small and unimportant will go to a three-judge chamber. Slightly different from that, something that's quite important, but highly technical, so that the judges are going to have to wrap a cold towel around their heads in order to understand it. That may also go to a three-judge chamber. If it goes to a three-judge chamber, there will probably be an advocate general's opinion to go with it. So effectively, you'll have three judges plus one, which is a weird way of putting it, perhaps, but it's in fact between a three-judge and a five-judge, isn't it, in terms of the amount of resources being devoted to the case. And that then leaves you with the five-judge chamber, which is really the workhorse of the court, right? I mean, if it's not small enough to go down or big enough to go up, guess what? It's going to end, end up in front of a five-judge chamber. Now I'm going to let you into a big, difficult to admit, but nevertheless important secret. My friends, the court is composed of human beings. The court sometimes gets this call wrong. Sometimes it sends something to the wrong size of court, and sometimes it stays with that size of court. Sometimes, however, the court notices that it got it wrong. And I'm going to give you as an example of that, the fact that Keck and Mitua started off as a case that went to a chamber. It went to the second chamber. Advocate General Van Gerven gave his opinion on the 18th of November, 92, he gave it for the second chamber after to close the oral procedure. And then the cha second chamber said, oh dear, I think we have a problem. I can say that. I'm saying it from the outside. I wasn't yet at the court. So I'm commenting from the outside. I'm not breach breaching the secret du délibéré when I say the court must have thought, oh dear, we got this wrong. They referred it to the full court. They then, of course, have to rerun the procedure. They need another hearing. They need a second opinion which Advocate General Van Gerven duly gave on the 28th of April, 93. And it's after that, that the full court does the U-turn on free movement of goods in Keck and Mitua. But sometimes it doesn't do all of that because by the way, that's terribly bad. Oh, my paws and whiskers, that's terribly bad for the statistics. Because of course the case takes much longer if you sent it to one chamber and then you have to refer it up and the court, I would not wish to say the court is fixated by its statistics, but it is acutely conscious of the fact that many people are watching the court to see how long cases take to get through the system. And it is bad for the statistics to have too many cases that where you have to have two goes at it. So, what, next question, was there an advocate general's opinion? I'm not just saying this because of the, as a former advocate general, of course, I'm enormously proud of the cases where I opined. I used to be called one of the most opinionated women in Europe, probably, probably fairly enough, actually. Uh, but seriously, whether there is an AG's opinion is an interesting token. If there isn't, you'll find a standard stock phrase in the judgment, the court has decided, comma, having heard the advocate general, comma, to proceed to judgment without an opinion. What that means is that during the general meeting of the court, when the court was deciding how to handle the case, the housekeeping for the case, there was a discussion or there was a recommendation with which the Advocate General concurred or didn't concur, in which case there will have been a discussion, as to whether the case needed an opinion. And there is a kind of sacred formula that is often used within the context of the uh, general meeting, Nous savons tous que les conclusions de l'avocat général sont toujours utiles, mais est-ce qu'en l'espèce, elles sont nécessaires? Translation, we know, of course, dear colleagues, that the Advocate General's opinion is always useful, but is it actually necessary in this case? Now, after that, you decide whether there's an opinion or not. So did it have an opinion? 
The rules say if there's no new point of law, then you don't need an opinion. The reality is that if you applied that rule, you would always have an opinion because, dear friends, we're all lawyers. We can all find a new point of law. Just rub the lamp a little bit and the genie will come out and we can find a new point of law. Huh? So what it really means is, is there a serious, important new point of law that's going to have a systemic effect on this area of EU law? That test is not written down anywhere, but the practical reality is that that is the test that's being applied. Advocate General's opinions are a scarce resource, relatively speaking, so they're given, and also, of course, they, they make the case handling longer, because so you have to wait for the AG to give his or her opinion. So you give the opinion to cases that, that need opinions, où les conclusions sont nécessaires. Then look and see if there was a hearing. I mean, you, please note, you haven't yet started reading the text, okay? You're just looking at the front end of the judgment and you're squeezing it for the additional information you can get out of the front end. Was there a hearing? There won't be a hearing just because the parties thought it would be fun to have a hearing and they wanted to go to Luxembourg and the lawyers wanted to put on their fancy kit and strut up and down and say, gosh, you know, I did a hearing in front of the court in Luxembourg. There will be a hearing if the court, underline the word the court, if the court thinks that there is value added to be gained from a hearing. And that's usually because the court thinks there's more to this case than we can simply understand from the basis of the written pleadings. There are additional questions that we want to ask. There are points we'd like them to, to focus on. And actually, if you do that by the medium of putting written questions to the parties to be answered at a hearing, that is actually, again, quicker in terms of case handling than sending them written questions for answer in writing, because if you do that, then the written question, the answers to the written questions when they come in will have to be translated and the legal translation by the lawyer linguist will take longer than an interpreter doing simultaneous interpretation of an answer given at a hearing. All right, There's very, usually very practical reasons behind why the court does things. Here's an example. Next, you can see what the relevant timeline was. All right, you can see when the case came in, when there was a hearing, if there was a hearing, when the AG gave their opinion, if there's an AG's opinion, when the court produces its judgment. Now, there is a little booby trap here, which I'll let you in on. The date for the AG's opinion is in fact deceptive. It's deceptive because the court and the, and the reporting judge in particular will have the opinion in draft form at the moment it was sent over to translation. They don't wait until it's been read out publicly, all right? At the moment that the opinion goes to translation, it also goes, obviously in draft form, but it goes onto the internal website, the site des présidents, and if it is in English or French, the internal échéancier, the internal timetable for the court, tells the, ad the reporting judge He's meant to start getting on with thinking about the case and producing either a note to start the discussion or a draft, first draft of the judgment. Time is running against him from the moment that that draft opinion went on to the seat de president. What can this actually mean? Well, if you have an opinion which is 30 pages and you allow time for it being translated and then the translation being checked and possible corrections discussed, and then it's titivated and finalized and it's produced. You know, you can be looking at more than a month between when the draft opinion went across to translation and therefore was made available to the court and the date at which the opinion was delivered. And obviously, if you have a much longer opinion, then correspondingly, it's more time. I used to have on my, my phone kind of permanently switched on I used to have a very, very abstruse formula called the délai standard de traduction, the standard formula for working out how much time you have to allow for translation. And with a really big opinion, you can be looking at two months. 
And you cannot say for every opinion, this is dead urgent, you've got, it's got to jump the queue, right? On the whole, you have to respect the time frame that you're being given. Now, all of this, everything I've just said, is before you read paragraph one. And it's already given you quite a feel, quite a valuable feel, for how the case made its way through the court and whether it had a smooth passage or a rocky passage. If you find there were some cases about uh, fish from memory, age gate and Jadero, which passed their first birthday on délibéré after the Advocate General's opinion had been delivered and before the judgment came out. I was working as a referendaire at the time. This does go back a long way. And I do remember, because referendaire are an irreverent lot, I remember that we did discuss whether we should make it a first birthday cake. <laughs> Usually cases do not take as long as that. I'm going to put a particular marker down for you on cases that are processed as urgent preliminary ruling procedures, or in the jargon, PPUs, Procédure Préjudicielle d'Urgence. Big, big, be careful with these cases, Marker. Why? Because the court is trying to go very fast. I nearly said too fast. The court has promised that it will turn around PPUs in a maximum of three months from when the order to ref for reference comes in to the moment the PPU judgment goes out. And in fact, there's a kind of competition to see if you can make it significantly less than three months. Now, these are often incredibly difficult and sensitive cases because that procedure is used for things like family law disputes, like asylum cases where somebody's detained, like criminal law cases where you have the European arrest warrant being interpreted, right? Now, it's being used because of the sensitivity of the case, because someone's in detention, because a child has been abducted. You know, you can see why it has to be done fast, all right? But often the points of law at issue in a PPU are actually not easy at all. And so if you see that the case is a PPU, your antennae should go straight up in the air. Watch this. This is be careful with this, because the court will be going faster than it really wanted to. OK, let's move on to the text. If there's an advocate general's opinion, please would you read it? No, I mean, I say that. I don't just say that because I spent years of my life writing opinions, all right? But I say read it because, first of all, it tends to be more accessible in style and in approach than the judgment. It's usually easier to read. Secondly, it should set out the issues and the options and the different possible approaches. The job of the Advocate General is to assist the court, and one of the ways of doing that job best is to try to show the court, look, there's the following ways of dealing with this problem. Let's have a look at them. Why do I recommend one rather than the other? Okay? And it may, third point, it may also cover points that the court never gets to because the court is always going to take the shortest way home, all right? A bit like a horse finding its stable. That was very disrespectful, wasn't it? The court will always try to take the shortest route home. Not just the court in Luxembourg, but any court. I say this against the background of having been at the bar for quite a while. Any court, any judge wants to take the short route home. If you can decide this case by dealing with point three, so that you don't have to deal with points one, two, and four, you will go straight for point three or say, I don't need to bother about those points at the moment. Let me concentrate on point three. Ah, I have solved point three. Well, having solved point three, no need to go back and look at two, one, two, and four. End of case. This is called being an efficient judge. It is being an efficient judge because the job of the judge is to decide the case and get it finished and moved on. That's 
not quite the same as the job of the Advocate General. The job of the Advocate General is to avoid taking the shortcuts, right? And sometimes to say, and there's a lot of opinions that do just this, to say, if the court agrees with me, that will be the end of the case. Full stop. Next point. However, in case the court does not agree with me, I now need to go on in order to look at these points, these additional points. And when you write that as the Advocate General, you probably think, I hope the court does agree with me on the first point, because it seems to me to be blindingly obvious, you know, that this case is inadmissible, for example, right? But nevertheless, you will go on and you will look at the substance, albeit briefly. All right. There is an analogy here I'm going to make. I made it in greater writing in a book that was put together recently uh, by uh, Graham Butler and Adam Wolfsky on the British Advocates General, which is actually a very good read because it takes key opinions by the four Advocates General who were put forward by the UK to serve in the court. And it uh, has very good distinguished scholars commenting on those opinions. And then it has afterwards from Francis Jacobs and David Edwards, who acted as an Advocate General in the General Court on one case, and your humble servant. And of course, the, the afterwards reflect the styles of their, of their respective authors. Uh, so that's in that, my own afterwards, I did put in the analogy that the work of the Advocate General is a bit like a scout going out in front of the army. And the army reaches a place where there are three roads, so it camps for the night. And the scout who was at Staff College with the general, but he went into military intelligence rather than into mainstream command, the scout goes out, he comes back, and the general says, well, what do you think? And the scout says, well, I wouldn't take the left-hand path because it ends up in a bog. I wouldn't take the middle path because mm, it's quiet, but it's suspiciously, actually it's not really quiet and it would be a wonderful place for an ambush. I would take the right-hand path. It looks a bit of a mess to start with, but after that it's fine. I would take the right-hand path. Your advocate general's opinion is doing that kind of a job, all right? It is scouting out the territory and it's giving a recommendation with reasons to the court as to why to take a particular path. <laughs> all right. If you've read the Advocate General's opinion, if there was an Advocate General's opinion, you know something. If you've read the Advocate General's opinion, you can either skip or skim the front half of the judgment, because you may have noticed that there is an enormous overlap. By the way, I have never yet understood why the court does not save an incredible amount of time and resources by working out a way of synthesizing this so that you've got one version of the relevant facts and law rather than getting the parallel text, because as soon as I say parallel text, you should be saying to me, aha, and you were talking about translation last seminar. And I'll go, yes, I was. Awful lot of translation is spent actually translating a second set of the same material. And sometimes it's not the same translator. Of course, you'd like it to be the same translator, but the same translator may be busy, so it may need to go to a different colleague and that's not a totally efficient way of sorting it out. Right. You have skipped the front half, or you've skim read it in case the court has highlighted some point that the Advocate General didn't highlight. Oh, I wonder why they're doing that. Hmm, interesting. Then, next thing, please remember that unlike the Advocate General's opinion, the judgment is a collective work, all right? It's drafted in French by judges working with French-speaking there and deliberating together in secret in a language, French, which, save for the lucky few, isn't their mother tongue. Actually, it may be their fifth language, all right? I say that and you think, why did she say fifth? Well, if you come from one of the former communist Eastern Bloc states, you have your mother tongue. If you're of an age to be a judge in the court, your second language is probably Russian because you probably did at least some of your studies in the Soviet Union. After that, your next language may be, French, may be German, it may be English, third language. 
Your fourth language is whatever wasn't your third language. So if it was mother tongue, Russian, German, then the next one is English. If it was mother tongue, Russian, English, the next one's German. I've got to five, haven't I, by that stage? Your fifth language is going to be French. I don't know about you, my friends, but my fifth language, which is Italian, I would not like to be trying to do a legal debate in Italian. I would feel very kind of iffy and uncomfortable, and I'm not really sure I'm going to express the, the real nuance of what I want to say to you in my Italian. Mi dispiace molto, but I'm not going to be able to do it, right? So, all of that, let's take the example of a case which is a reference for a preliminary ruling. Ask yourself the question, having looked at what is set out and therefore what the National Court did ask, did the court rewrite it? This is a big, big hint. There are a lot of references where the court uses words such as, in essence, comma, what the National Court seeks to ascertain is dot, dot, dot. Yeah? And then you get a total rewrite of what the National Court asked. Sometimes the rewrite is a, is a kind of packaging, right, of what the National Court asked. Sometimes already in how the court rewrites the questions, you may be able to pick up where it's going to go with the answer. I'm going to give you the example, again, going back to when I was a referendaire. I am so antique that I was a referendaire at the court when the first factor tame case came through. That is the case that was the interim relief case, the reference from the House of Lords asking about suspending an act of parliament in order to give interim protection, right? That's, that's where that story was starting. Uh, so that's case C21389, the first in the factor tame sequence. The House of Lords had made a reference and the reference was a very typical House of Lords reference. And the question, the two questions referred, and the first question referred was a bit like a Gothic cathedral with, you know, flying buttresses and fan vaulting and everything, right? And it said where, and then there were, from memory, six sub-paragraphs. And then it said, does community law either oblige or require? And it went on to go on asking the rest of the question. I mean, it was a very beautiful artistic creation, but it was a question that was completely incomprehensible to the court because... The court doesn't write like that. I was working as a referendaire for Gordon Slim. It was a very small court. And a number of my colleague referendaire came along to my office and fell in through the door and said, hi, Eleanor. And then they said, what the hell is the House of Lords asking? And we sat down and we kind of looked at it together. And basically, there were two ways of rewriting the question. If you rewrote the question as being do you have to create a brand new remedy under community law called suspending an act of parliament? Then the answer was going to be no. And the answer was going to be no because the line of case law going back as far as Rafer and Comet says that you exercise your rights within the structure of national procedural law. And it's not about creating new remedies. So if you rewrote the question that way around, you got to that line of argument and that answer, all right? If, on the other hand, you rewrote it as saying, well, you know, um, if you've got an obvious right under, under community law, and there's some piffling little rule of national law, like you can't get into relief against the Crown, some you know, minor little rule, well, I mean, obviously, applying our decision that we have already sitting there in the case law, applying Siementhal, you should just, the national court should just put aside that little rule of national law. So, having rewritten the question referred by the House of Lords that way round, obviously not using the words piffling and little, it was the court writing judgment, but you get the message. Having rewritten the question referred 
that way round, that took you through to the Simmental line of case law and it took you through to that answer. So when you see that the court has done a rewrite, please look very carefully at how the rewrite has been done. I talked a little last time around about the use of formulae, about using known building blocks, about making abstract statements. I'm not going to repeat all of that. I'm going to make another statement. I apologize how blindingly obvious most of this is, right? But I hope it's useful. I'm going to make another statement, which is removing text is quicker than writing in replacement text. Removing text, in order to get to the decision to remove text, you need to look around the room and see that there's a problem with this particular passage. A number of your colleagues will start saying, yeah, I'm not, not really too sure about paragraph 26. No, no, well, actually, thank you. I, I also have problems with paragraph 26, you know. And looking around as the reporting judge trying to shepherd this through the delibere, you start to say to yourself, you know, mm, I think maybe we should, I know my referendaire liked it and was very proud of the drafting, but actually I think we had better take paragraph 26 out. So far, so good. But then the problem is, what do you put in place of paragraph 26? And it is much more difficult, believe me, to find the new text to put in than it was to decide to take the text out. If you could write it one way round, and that will satisfy these two colleagues, but that colleague won't like it. Or we do it your way round, but then at that moment you start saying, I'm sorry, I can't live with that. So, of course, of course this shouldn't happen. Of course you should just spend the time and the effort to discuss it, to find the compromise ways through, to find a new text, possibly one paragraph, possibly three paragraphs, who knows, that you put in there that, you know, re reflects the consensus and... The so there isn't a hole. Unfortunately, that is not what always happens. You can sometimes really see where the electronic scissors went across the page. You really can. And usually your giveaway for that is that you're reading the text and then the court then says to you, il s'en suit que, it follows that. And you kind of, Blink, you, did I nod off there? The court has just said A, B, C, F, G, K. That's not the normal structure of the alphabet. I must have nodded off, let me read it again. So you do read it again and you get exactly the same mental reaction. There's a hole in this text. Um, where there's a hole in the text, it may be that the court has reached a compromise decision as to what the outcome should be, but it hasn't actually worked out which of the possible ways of going there it would like. I'm going to give you, again, I'm sorry to refer to my cases. I apologize, but it's kind of, it's what, it's what old barristers and old advocates generally do. So bear with me. Uh, Ruth Sambrano. Reese Sambrano, I wrote a really long opinion. I wrote it with Daniel Sarmiento, who is a wonderful Spanish constitutional lawyer with a knowledge of American constitutional law. And it was our pride and joy in creation. We took it through at least four drafts before we were satisfied with it. It was a jumbo opinion, all right? The court, by the way, I was very unpopular with the president because it did take a long time to write the opinion in Reese Sambrano. The court in the Grand Chamber sort of got to roughly the same place in terms of end result about citizenship of the Union. It did so after it had recited all the facts and the questions. It did so with eight paragraphs. As the Advocate General, I have no idea at all what the court's internal reasoning was that got it to the answer that it gave. I am in no better position than any of you, though I did write the opinion, because I do not actually know from what is out there in the judgment how they got from the starting point to the answer. My hunch is that they decided what the answer was going to be 
and then they sort of put something down and moved on to the next case because there was not much agreement as to how you got to the answer. That's purely a hunch. I have no inside knowledge, but I do know that because the opinion in Rissembrano was long, but the judgment was short, there have been an awful lot of follow-up cases of national courts asking the Court of Justice, sorry, what did you mean by Rissembrano? Additional point here, is the court going to tell you we got it wrong earlier? Well, the court is very reluctant to admit that it got X wrong. So when you see wording in the judgment which says it's going to clarify what it said in an earlier judgment, this may be a hint that it's about to go off in a different direction. Clarification does sometimes equate to actually we've changed our mind. Now, there are honourable examples of the court actually being prepared to say, look, we're going to do something different. I'm going to refer you here. There's the two decisions involving Haag. So there was the first Haag case, case 19273, and Solon against Haag, Haag 1. And then there was Haag 2, which is case C10 of 89, CNL Sukal against Haag. Uh, that came after a magisterial opinion from Advocate General Jacobs. And in Hard 2, paragraph 10, we find the court saying to us, bearing in mind the points outlined in the order for reference and in the discussions before the court concerning the relevance of the court's judgment in case 19273 Van Solen against Haag, to the reply to the question asked by the National Court, comma, it should be stated at the outset that the court believes it necessary to reconsider the interpretation given in that judgment in the light of the case law, which has developed with regard to the relationship between industrial and commercial property and the general rules of the treaty, particularly in the sphere of the free movement of goods. Now, apart from saying, I wish the court could use a full stop and produce shorter paragraphs, they would be easier to read to understand and also to read aloud. Here we do have the court saying very clearly, we are reconsidering. It doesn't, at a later point in the judgment, then pick apart the earlier judgment. It just gets somewhere different. Uh, in Keck and Mituar, in joint cases C26791 and C26891, uh, there, as I said earlier on, we have it going to a smaller chamber, first opinion, referral up to the full court, second opinion from Advocate General Van Heeren, then the court's judgment. We have the passage which uh, Professor Barnard will be quoting at length when she's lecturing on free movement of goods, I know, uh, starting at paragraph 14 of the judgment which begins, in view of the increasing tendency of traders to invoke Article 30 of the treaty as a means of challenging any rules whose effect is to limit their commercial freedom, even where such rules are not aimed at products from other member states, the court considers it necessary to re-examine and clarify its case law on this matter. Then they recite established case law under Cassis de Dijon, and then at paragraph 16, the court after some heart searching perhaps, says, by contrast, contrary to what has previously been decided, the application to products from other member states of national provisions restricting or prohibiting certain selling arrangements is not such as to hinder directly or indirectly actually or potentially trade between member states within the meaning of the decimal judgment, so long as, and then there's the test to be applied but they do actually say contrary to what has previously been decided. They don't that often tell you up front, but when they say they're going to clarify, and if it's in the grand chamber, that may be quite a good hint that what you're going to get out the far end will not be exactly what it went in the front end. I said the court wants to take a short route home. Sometimes the short route home is anything but a shortcut. I will refer you there to a couple of cases that I did as, as an advocate general, of course. Uh, case C3109, Bol Bol, which is about the rights of Palestinian refugees and whether they get some kind of special treatment compared to an ordinary refugee. 
And the court decided, I answered the three questions referred. The court decided it would be clever and answer only the first question referred. What was the result? Well, the court got a second reference in case C364, 11, Abed El Karim El Kot and others from the same national court, which was a court in Hungary, not a very pleased national court, which made the second reference say, we referred three questions in Bol Bol. We have a number of cases waiting. We were waiting for an answer to those three questions. You only answered the first question. So we are now going to re-refer questions two and three verbatim, which are questions one and two in this reference. And would you kindly give us an answer? So sometimes the shortcut home doesn't, doesn't work. But you know, you can, if you look carefully, you can actually sometimes find more material, more background in the judgment that enables you to see and to understand more of what the court's thinking will have been. Now, I had intended to produce a worked example, as it were, and I can see I'm not going to have time to do that and have questions. So I will tell you that my worked example would have been FIFA. That's joint cases C39701 to C40301, FIFA and others. You may or may not remember that FIFA is a case about working time, uh, rules on working time. It's a case which got two <laughs> opinions from Advocate General Richard Bocolomer because the court reopened the oral procedure. If you see that happening, you know that this is going to be a complicated and difficult case because the, look at the way the courts handled it. And if you read the judgment in FIFA, the, the court really goes back and forth between one argument and the other argument. And it, it takes about 80 paragraphs to make up its mind what it's finally going to say. And I bet there were a number of very heated discussions in the deliberation. As I say, it's a, it's a 2004 case. It's not a case which was when I was at the court, and I'm not revealing anything that is secret. But if you just look at the text, look at the background and look at the text, you can see that Pfeiffer gave the court an awful lot of trouble. It really did. I'm going to finish with two cases which I think show the problem of the court not being clear the first time round. And uh, my example is I start with a good old favourite, Foster and British Gas. Uh, Foster and British Gas is case C188 of 89. And it decides what is an emanation of the state for the purposes of vertical direct effect. And buried there in Foster and British Gas is the test. And the test is a non-exhaustive test because it says that certain bodies are in any event included, but it refers to, to bodies that enjoy special rights that go beyond the rights that would normally be enjoyed by such a body. Now, that is a bad translation, but so is the text in the judgment, of the French administrative law term, pouvoir exorbitant. It was, of course, discussed in French in the deliberation, and I am as sure as I can be that the French judge would have referenced pouvoir exorbitant and the case law of the Conseil d'État, and he would have said to his colleagues, this is a good workable test for deciding whether something is so closely to being part of the state that it should be treated as the state, and so it should have vertical direct effect applied against it. Let's put pouvoir exorbitant into the text. Put pouvoir exorbitant into the text. It, of course, needed translating into English because English was the language of the case. This is a reference from the House of Lords. I was working for Sir Gordon Slen at the time. I remember the then head of English translation coming to talk to Sir Gordon Slen about the draft translation into English and how on earth we were going to translate pouvoir exorbitant. And none of us, not one of the three of us, 
could think of a really good translation because the point was it wasn't just the words. It, the words came with a particular legal context and connotations and echoes and, you know, it, it was not just the words. So we came up with a formula which went into Foster and British Gas. By a strange quirk of fate, much, much later as Advocate General, I was the Advocate General in case C41315, the second Farrell case. And guess what? The National Court needed to know whether the Motor Insurance Bureau is an emanation of the state for the purposes of vertical directive head. And if, if you can bear to revisit my opinion in that case, you will find that I set out the problem with Foster and British Gas. I even set out what I've just said to you. And then I spend the rest of the opinion trying to come up with material to help the court to address this problem created by its own case law in order to enable the ordinary working lawyer, the ordinary working judge, to see whether you're in a situation where vertical direct effect applies. I'm going to stop there. We have just a little time for questions, if people would like. <laughs>